So tonight we're going to talk about natural language processing, kind of give an introduction to it. Um, there's a section towards the end of this mod that goes a lot more in depth, um, uses you know, neural networks, that kind of stuff. Um, so this will kind of introduce some of the topics and some of the ta challenges and techniques. Um, so basically, uh, NLP has a ton of applications. Any kind of text, um, you can do pretty much anything with it as far as like translation, um, sentiment analysis, which we'll do a little bit of tonight. Um, so that's basically looking at a text or like a tweet or something and basically determining whether it's positive or negative, um, whether it's sarcastic or not. Um, so kind of determining something about the text itself um, and its meaning um, just from the words that it uses. Um, also question answering. So, and that kind of goes with the next one, chatbots. Um, so basically like Siri and stuff, I mean, that kind of translates it into from uh, audio to text first, but, um, or any kind of app that you've used where you're interacting with like a robot, um, that kind of stuff. So lots of really cool applications for it. Um, a really cool field to get into if you're interested. Um, so some of the challenges though of NLP um, because we are trying to translate text into kind of numerical data that a computer can understand. Um, it's kind of hard, it's kind of easy to lose meaning. Um, and there's the problem of context. So for example, um, this first sentence might be um, difficult for a computer to understand. Um, I was led to believe that the fire festival would be an amazing transcendent, um, can't see this last part, Eve. Hold on. Transcendent event, I was conned. Um, so a computer, you know, might not understand the fire festival, the context around it, how it was a scam, um, all of that. So a sentence like that would be difficult. Um, and then you also just have ambiguity. Um, so if you say the pipe couldn't fit through the hole in the wall since it was too big, um, you know, are we referring to the uh, pipe being too big or the wall um, versus the pipe couldn't fit through the hole in the wall since it was too small, kind of the same thing. So kind of knowing, you know, what subject is being talked about and which adjectives and stuff, um, that's kind of a difficult challenge, especially in English, because we don't have basically the structure to tell that. You have to kind of just know and understand the context of the sentence. So um, the big library we're going to use for all of this is called NLTK. Um, you might have it installed, you might not. So maybe try checking that now here. If we go down, okay, have it below. There you go. Yeah. So just try and import it. Um, let me know if you have it installed. I do, but it looks like I've got a particular resource that's missing from my NLTK. What's it say? Uh, look up error resource punks not found. So it looks like I have to do like a NLTK dot download for that. Yeah, you'll have to. Yeah, NLTK makes you download a lot of stuff. Um, they have different corpuses and kind of different like dictionaries and stuff. Mm -hmm. depending on what you're doing. So I'll give you guys a second. Um, is everyone else able to install it or was already installed? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> All right, so the first topic, because um, thinking about this, you know, we have a sentence of words, for example, um, and we need to somehow translate it into numbers so that we can do things with it in Python. Um, so kind of the first step is tokenization. Um, so this is basically um, breaking down a sentence into words. Um, so this is one example. We have a sentence here. And then this is kind of the syntax of how you call it. It's called word underscore tokenized. Um, if we run that, it'll basically split it into words. Um, you'll notice, though, it keeps the number and also the punctuation as separate words or tokens. So that's kind of one option for tokenization. But you could also have a paragraph and then tokenize it by sentences. So if we do sent tokenize, that will break it down into sentences. And it basically will look for punctuation and capitalization 
behind the scenes and find a way to split it up. Um, so those are two different options because sometimes you're just concerned with like, you know, word level and other times it's sentence level. Um, so there's those things. Um, so there's a lot of pre-processing involved. Um, as you can see, you know, we have punctuation in here, which is kind of a problem for when we're doing the, uh, let's see, how do I go back up? When we're doing the word tokenization, you know, maybe we don't really want the periods and stuff in it. So we can remove punctuation. And this is kind of an easy way to do it. Um, I think you will have to import string here. I forgot that. Um, but if you run this, it will take that sentence we had with the period um, and basically strip out all the punctuation. Um, and then if we tokenize it, we can see that we just got the actual words and then the one number. All right, so another thing for pre-processing is stop words, which are basically, you can think of them as noise or just really common words. So words like a, the, and, usually those aren't significant and they're gonna be in almost every sentence. Um, so they don't really add anything. Um, so we can usually remove them. So to do that, we're going to download a file here through an LTK called stop words. It's basically a list of all the most common stop words. Um, and then we're going to use the English ones. Um, so we're just going to grab that list here so that we can view it. Um, so we'll print this out. So it'll download it. And then we can see, you know, it's um, words that are just common that don't really add any context or meaning. They're kind of just filler words that um, bridge your sentence together. Um, so removing those will make our models focus more so on the significant and different words. All right, so here's just an example of kind of a process. So we have the sentence here. We're going to strip out the punctuation and then we're going to um, tokenize it. And then we're going to go through each token. And if it's in our stop words list, we're going to basically remove it or not include it in our final filtered list. So we can see it took out the punctuation, it tokenized it. It also took out the words R and U because um, those are common, those are stop words. It even took out doing. Um, you can also customize your stop word list. Maybe there's some words you still want to include, um, but this is kind of a, a simple workflow for um, pre-processing. All right, another thing is stemming. So it's basically reducing words to their roots. So words like um, running, for example. So like run, running, ran, like they all kind of mean the same thing, even though they have you know different spelling and uses, but it all relates to the root run. Um, so stemming can kind of help you condense and make all those words the same. Um, so to do that, we use this Porter Stemmer um, object from NLTK, um, and you just want to create an instance of it. And then you can just do the object.stem and then pass in a word. So for running, it changes it to run. Um, we can throw in anything here. Verbs are really obvious. Um, trying to think what else. Um, yeah, verbs are going to be the big thing because they change their ending depending on the sentence. Um, so that's kind of the biggest use case for them. Um, but then the other related option is lemmatization. And this is reducing words to their base words. So um, you'll see an example here in a second and how it's different. Um, but this is basically how you create the object for it. It's off of this WordNet library and then it's called WordNet Lemmatizer. And so now um, we're first going to do lemmatization on flying, and then we're going to get the, um, the stemming of flying and see what we get. So you can see here, the lemmatization did fly, whereas the other did FLI, um, because it probably, uh, you know, there's like flight, um, flights, so it's kind of all reducing it down to um, that kind of root. 
Um, and then another example that's interesting is better. Oh, and I should probably say um, this other value we're passing in here, that's the part of speech. So since some words have, um, they're spelled the same, but they could be two different parts of speech, um, you have to pass in the part of speech here. Um, if you go to NLTK, they have a list of all the abbreviations, but B, B is verb. Um, so that's why we put that there. Um, but if we do better um, as an, an adjective, we can see that the um, base of that is actually good. So there's cases where, you know, it's not even like part of the word, um, but it kind of means the same thing, um, like good, better, best. Um, it's just kind of an odd one in English that completely changes form. And then another thing is part of speech tagging, um, kind of related to that. Um, so NLTK has a way to basically break down a sentence into its parts of speech, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so if we have this sentence here, Albert Einstein was born in Ulm, Germany in 1879, we can tokenize it and then pass it through this POS tag function. And we can see it assigns um, a part of speech to each one. I'd have to look up what each of these means, but um, I mean, this is like a proper noun. Um, let's see, this is a verb and then I'm not sure what the last part means, but probably, let's see, was born. Um, I forget the word for it when it's like the helper verb, um, but that's basically probably what that is. Um, if you Google like NLTK abbreviations, you might be able to get a list here. I think I saw one. So Matt, related to that, these tags that come out of the um, parts of speech tagger from NLTK, can they be the standard ones that then go into the limitizer? Yeah, since it's all NLTK, um, all the abbreviations work the same. Okay. I swear there was a list that I had earlier. Um, okay, here's some of it. So yeah, I mean, this might be a good resource here. Um, this seems to, this is from NLTK. Uh, so I'll just throw this in the Slack channel. But you can do a lot of cool things um, if you can break it down into parts of speech. All right, there's that. Um, and yeah, for NLTK, like how we had to download um, the stop words. Um, you basically just have to download things as you go. Um, it'll give you an error, like if you don't have it, um, or if you're looking up how to do something, it'll basically say you need to install um, or download this like data set or corpus or whatever. All right, so um, a way to kind of assign a score to words in a sentence um, or in a document is called TF-IDF. Um, so a simple method would be to kind of um, count up words as they occur and basically assign a score based on just their occurrence. But then you're gonna have words that you know appear a lot that don't really tell you much. Um, and that's where TF-IDF comes into play. It has the longest name, um, term frequency inverse document frequency, which really doesn't make sense. Um, so I have a picture here that kind of explains what it does. Um, but it basically takes into account the frequency of a term. Um, okay, so a document is basically like a book you can think of, for example. Um, so say we have a bunch of books by this author. Um, so each of the books is a document. Um, so if in one of the books, um, the author uses a certain word, like a lot, 
but they don't really use it in any of the other books, then that word would end up having a high TF-IDF score. But if an author has a favorite rare word that he tends to use in all of his books, um, then that word would not have a large TF-IDF score um, because it occurs a lot across all the documents. Um, so TF-IDF really helps to um, measure like the originality of the word, like it says here, um, by taking into account how often it appears across all the documents. Um, so this is kind of the preferred way of um, generating vectors for NLP. Um, you can also just do it by count. Um, that does work sometimes, um, but usually this gives you better results. And we'll kind of see both here in a second. Um, so first to do TF-IDF, um, this one we actually have to use from SKLearn. For some reason, NLCK doesn't have the capability yet. Um, so we'll import this here. And then the TF-IDF vectorizer takes um, a tokenization parameter. And it's basically a function that will tokenize the text that you pass in. So you either have to use one that's already created or create your own function like we're doing here. Um, so in here, you could do all of your pre-processing. So we're actually just going to take all the tokens. We're going to tokenize it first. And then we're also going to um, get all the stems using the Porter Stutter. Um, but you can include other things in here. You could remove stop words. Um, you could remove numbers, um, remove punctuation, all different things like that. So we have that function, and we'll go ahead and run that. So they're on this last part. Okay. So then to create that object, our vectorizer, um, in this tokenizer, we have to pass in our function and tokenize. Um, and then there's also the parameter stop words. Um, that will actually include it in here so we don't have to do it in the tokenization. Um, and we obviously want English. So this, like all other sklearn models, creates a model um, that we're going to use. So um, this here is basically, uh, I forgot to upload these files. So this part isn't going to run for you guys. I basically have six text files. Um, they're like works by Steinbeck. And this basically just joins them all um, and creates a token dictionary. Um, so I'll send them to you as you're working on the activity so you have them. But just if you run this part, you'll get an error. Um, so this just reads all these texts and combines them. It's from uh, the book Pearl, I guess. Um, and then this is how you would actually fit and transform that vectorizer object. So you call fit transform on it. And then you're going to pass in your um, values here, which if we take a look at what these are. Okay, so this is basically, um, I think, all the different sentences within the book. And then we fit in, let's see, uh, that just creates a I want this down here. Yeah, so there's what that is. And that's what we're passing into the fit transform. And if we go back to the slideshow. So then with that um, transformed TF-IDF, um, we can basically pass in um, a sentence and transform it. And I did not properly fit it. I changed that to markdown. Hold on. I think this needs to just be this part. Don't save it to an object if it's like that. Um, so then we'll run that. And there it's training it. OK, we're fitting it. Now we can run this. And so this basically. This basically is our TF IDF values um, for this sentence. So you notice we only get three. Um, that's because a bunch of these are stop words. Like I think probably all and are. Um, and we can actually check. Um, so these numbers are basically the IDs. Um, so we can take one of those, like the 2024, um, and plug that into this get 
feature names. And so that tells us that that's for the word thing. So if we go back here, so thing has kind of a low TF-IDF. Um, this middle word here has quite a high one because um, it's basically from zero to one. Um, so we'll copy that ID and then pass it in here. So loan, that's a lot more of a unique um, word and it has a higher TF-IDF score. Um, so that's why you see that there. Um, so yeah, so this breaks down the sentence, removes the stop words, and then generates the TF-IDF scores for each of the leftover words. So Matt, higher TF-IDF indicates um, more uniqueness, right? Right, yep. So does it mean that it uh, appears in this one document? Um, not all documents. Right, right. So it's like a, it might appear a lot in this specific document, but across all the documents, it's rare. Okay. All right, and then that's just checking that word. All right, so now we're going to go through an example of a classification um, task. Matt, yep. Sorry, uh, I'm just. You probably went over this, but I'm getting an error for the vectors. For which part? Um, vectors equals TF underscore IDF underscore vec. Like the transformation, the fitting. Oh, I'm just take out the equals, just call it a fit transform. Did that work? No. What's the error say? Empty vocabulary. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. That won't work. Sorry. Because um, that's from this. Like I said, I, I didn't include these files. Um, so that part won't actually work right now. OK. Yep. Thank you. And I'll send the files so you can run this. Um, but basically, then, um, when you get this, uh, when you use transform off of it then, pass in a phrase, you get these mm -hmm. IDs mm -hmm. and then the TF-IDF scores. Um, and then you can copy the IDs and paste them in this get features name uh, function. Cool, and that's yeah. What the, the word is corresponding to. Cool. Yep. All right, so we're gonna do a little example here of a classification task to kind of bring all these together and have it make a little bit more sense. Um, so we'll run this to load our data, and this was that large file. It's basically a giant CSV of lyrics um, from like a bunch of artists. Um, so it's a really big file. Um, I'm gonna take a second to load. So we're gonna drop um, any NAs. I noticed that some of the lyrics are missing, um, which will give us problems. And then our task is we're going to basically choose two artists um, and train a model on both of their lyrics and then see if we can get it to be able to take in a new lyric and determine which artist it should um, correspond to. So I just chose um, Beyonce for the first one and then uh, I checked how many lyrics she actually has, 248, um, but I'm actually going to cut it down to 30 just to make it a little bit easier and smaller. Um, so this basically will sample 30 of her lyrics and then get the indexes of those rows. Um, you guys might end up with different samples because I'm not setting a random state here, but we should get kind of similar results at the end. So that's Beyonce. And then I thought it'd be funny to um, compare it with like Barbra Streisand, something completely different. Um, so this also is 30 random samples of her songs. Um, and then we're just getting the index of those so that we can grab them from our data frame. And then so I'll go to the next slide there. Um, so this will basically grab all of the songs for Beyonce and all the songs for Barbara um, from our original data frame. Um, so if the index is in the Beyonce list or if it's in the Barbara list, it'll add it. That's basically what this does. So now if we look at our data frame, it's just going to be all the Beyonce and Barbara songs. So now the next thing to do is just drop the columns we don't need. We really only need our um, lyrics and then our target is going to be the artist. 
So we're going to drop these other columns. So we just have the artist, which is our target, and then the lyrics, which we're going to do some NLP on. So now we have to just encode our target. Um, so we're just going to make it a zero if it's Beyonce and a one if it's um, Barbara. And you can take a look at what that looks like. All right, so now the first thing we're going to try is kind of the simple way. It's um, just a count vectorizer. Um, so it basically just counts up the number of occurrences of each word um, in each lyric. Um, and you'll pass in here a max features. So this is basically, it'll choose the 10,000 most significant words um, and use those. And so then it'll basically, you'll have, you know, like word, one word, two, and then um, it'll basically count up in each lyric how many times those occur. So maybe word one occurred three times, word two one time, um, and it'll basically do that for all of the, the words that um, it chose. And then that becomes the data that you're passing in. That's like your X. Um, and you can choose different things here. Um, We'll do 10,000 at first, but we can change it. Um, and then this gives you a matrix object, which you need to call this fit transform off of. Or no, wait, this is the, the matrix is actually just the vectorizer. And then you fit transform, and then you have to do the two array um, because you get this weird data type after this, I think. Um, let's just do type X. Yeah, so it's a sparse matrix, um, which you have to like look into a little bit to understand. Um, but it's basically um, it's similar to a NumPy uh, array or matrix, but it's different and it doesn't work with everything. So you have to do the two array um, to get it to like NumPy format. So we have our x there. Um, so now we just need to split our data. Um, so we'll do a train test split, um, passing in that X, and then our target is just the artist column. And then we're just going to use random forest just to make it easy. You can obviously do different models, um, and we'll fit on the train data. And then this will just give us our accuracy score of both the train and the test. So there, that really simple model, 30 songs each. On the train, 100% accuracy. On the test, 83% accuracy. Not bad for out of the box. I mean, Barbara and Beyonce are like really different, so I'm sure their <laughs> lyrics are really different. Um, you could probably try it with like more similar artists, and it might be a little bit more challenging. Um, but yeah, once you get the um, text data into like vector format, it's really easy. It's just like any other data you would use, and you can just pass it into any classifier or model. Um, so now we'll compare it to um, the TF-IDF vectorizer. Um, so we'll do the same thing as before, really, um, and get our vectors here. And this time this should work. And then we'll do train test split, random forest classifier, and check our scores. Um, now before I run this, like it might be worse than the first one, um, but we are getting um, let's see, or no, we are doing the same split, I guess. Okay, so I think it, yeah, it actually ends up being the same. Um, so one is not necessarily comparing like the count vectorizer and the TF-IDF, one's not necessarily more accurate than the other, um, but it seems that recently TF-IDF is a lot more popular. If you go on Kaggle and look at any NLP competitions, um, TF-IDF is almost always going to be preferred. Um, but you can use both and get similar results in a lot of cases. All right, and then one more thing. Um, so there's n-grams. Uh, let me, something known as n-grams. So here we've been looking at just, you know, one word, um, but we could take a sentence. Um, so the cat, Chased the dog. So at first we were just, you know, looking at each word 
breaking it down that way into tokens. Um, but what you can do is break it down into n number of words. So now if we, if we do a bigram, um, so that's a two gram, um, we can take each two word pair. So the cat, cat chase, chase the, and the dog. So then those become our tokens. You can also do trigrams. So that would be the cat chased, cat chased the, and chased the dog. So those allow you to have a little bit more context um, and also have more unique tokens because um, you're probably not going to have that many occurrences of the cat chased. But if you have a book about a cat, um, you're going to get the cat token a ton. Um, so this can give you a big increase in performance. Um, and you can actually combine all of them. So you can have all the single tokens, you can have all the bigrams and all the trigrams, um, or you could just do one of them. And so this here in the NLTK library um, dot bigrams, this will basically create all the bigrams for us. So this was just like the first lyric, I think, in the data, um, but you can see it splits it into um, two word pairs. And you could also do it for trigram here, I believe. Um, but the cool thing with the sklearn library um, for like the, let's see, for the count vectorizer, you can pass in an n-gram range. So this basically, um, I guess, so if it, was, if it was one, one, that would be just single word tokens. Um, if it's two, two, that's just um, two word pairs. So just bigrams, three, three would just be trigrams. Um, if we did one, two, that would be single words up to bigrams. So it'd be all the single words and then all the bigram pairs. Um, and you could also do like one, three or two, three. Um, so lots of different options there. Um, but it's nice that you can just include that in here and you don't have to actually process it out yourself. Um, so this will do um, a bigram on the same data and just see what score we get. Um, so that actually ended up doing worse. Um, so it won't necessarily um, give you better results, um, but it can be something to try um, if you are struggling to see um, accurate performance. Um, okay. So we'll go into the activity next, but does anyone have any questions before we do? This probably seems like a lot of random stuff, but I promise it'll make sense once you like uh, start digging into it and uh, getting your hands dirty. Uh, Matt, so the sklearn count vectorizer function Mm -hmm. um there is a like max features um what the features mean here so that's basically the number of words so in this case that means it'll only look at the 10,000 most important words if i change this to 10 we're going to see a hit to performance because it's only going to look at the 10 most important words and give the occur occurrence counts of each of those um, for each of the lyrics. So there's probably a happy medium with this. Like you could probably do um, some kind of uh, like for loop and then like a graph to kind of see how your accuracy changes. Um, but yeah, there's probably like some sweet spot, which actually just a hundred seems to be decent. I guess the test isn't super good, but yeah, somewhere around 100 is probably good. Probably the less, the better, because um, if you have like 10,000, um, that's going to be a lot of processing time, especially if you have a larger data set than just 30 lyrics. Um, so you probably want to keep that as low as possible. Thank you. Yep. All right, so for the activity, um, we're going to do a sentiment analysis task. Um, you're going to use the data in this, um, I actually have the uh, line here because I discovered you have to include this encoding parameter or it won't um, load the CSV. 
Um, but it's basically a bunch of tweets um, people have made about nuclear power. And then it's been classified um, as positive or negative um, based on what they think of nuclear power in general, um, based off the text of their tweet. So your target, um, we can go ahead and look at the file here. So you have your text of your tweet, um, the sentiment, I think probably positive, neutral, and negative. And then it just has a more explained version of the sentiment. So you can probably drop this, but you can look at it before you do. Um, so this is your target, and then you have your text here. So you need to decide what pre-processing you need to do. You know, maybe look at some examples and um, what they look like in general. Um, and then choose a method to create your vectors. And then basically just choose a classification model, plug your vectors in and the target, and see what kind of results you get. So if everyone's ready, we'll pause recording. Uh, we started by dropping the third column. After looking at the value counts, um, we saw that there's one row where for sentiment where the value is tweet not related to nuclear energy. So we found the index, dropped that row. Um, we also saw that there was 160 neutral um, values for sentiment, uh, whereas negative was about 19. and I think positive was 10 or the other way around. Um, so later on, we're going to have to balance or I guess work on the imbalance problem. And so um, we assigned values for our target, uh, zero for neutral, negative one for negative, one for positive. Um, and then we used both count vectorizer and uh, and the TF IDF vectorizer. Um, we fit our data and we use SMOT to resample the data um, to, to balance out our data. Uh, train test split fit our random forest classifier and got a score of about 77 percent accuracy um for the tf idf we got a score of 99 percent accuracy um this is the confusion matrix of our tf idf um Julia, do you want to have read this? So down the diagonal, it tells us what it actually is true for each label. So we have the out of each one, like basically they all look really good because they're outside of the diagonal shows everything that could be false, right? So there's nothing that is showing that it's wrong without if i'm saying that correct if that makes sense how i'm saying it right yeah um uh, i didn't do this for one above but i can as well just so you guys can see the difference um, yeah it's just like a pretty big difference the, the big thing here was um, yeah it was very imbalanced why does mine yeah. look like that? Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to get my confusion matrix and it's not coming out like that for some reason. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I would just copy exactly what he has. You yeah. can either do it that way or uh, import confusion matrix and then plot it with like Seaborn or something. Um, but this is probably the easiest way. Well, I mean, I did for the for the second one, but mine didn't. I don't have the same numbers. I guess because we didn't have the same 
maybe random state. Yeah. Because I was able, I know that my first one wasn't coming out because I had named the same late, um, variables for the thing. So it was kind of confusing it. So, but for the second one, it did come out. It's just not the same as his, but that's okay. <laughs> but good job. Um, yeah, this was like a small data set. Usually with NLP, you want a ton of data. Um, so that's kind of the other take home. Like this was only a hundred and some tweets. You'd really want, you know, thousands, tens of thousands. Um, but I did want to show you guys one cool thing you can do then. So since we have a model, I can make up a new tweet and plug it in and see what it thinks. So this tweet is nuclear power is dumb and the worst thing ever. So um, you can see it did classify it correctly as negative. Um, and then I did another one. Nuclear power is all right to me. <laughs> and it said that was positive. So pretty cool. Um, I played around with some others and it wasn't totally accurate. It took a while to find these examples. Um, but with more data, you can definitely um, get a really accurate model. Um, so it's really fun to play around with. Um, just to give you an idea for capstones, a few people have done an NLP task and then basically made a website that hosted the model and allowed people to enter in tweets or you know news headlines or things like that to actually try it out for themselves. Um, so it can be really cool and interactive. Um, but the main thing here is you just have to pass in the new tweet as a list to your um, vectorizer um, and then just call the transform and you can call it, you can pass that then into the uh, classifier um, so it's pretty easy but all right uh, does anyone have any questions on anything NLP related before we go so this week um what section shall we cover? So we're basically going in order now. We kind of just skipped the first section. We'll come back to that towards the end. Um, so Wednesday is intro to neural networks. So this so week that is um, intro topics. And then the next week we'll go like into more depth with them. OK, so basically 43, 44 mm -hmm. and 46. Uh, let me just double check. So definitely 44 is Wednesday. Um, and then, let's see. There are three sections on your network. Oh, more. So I think then the next week sections um, 45 and 46 will be combined because they're kind of short and they're both just deeper into neural networks. And then that next Wednesday, um, I haven't decided yet actually. Um, we could do the deep NLP just so it's like consistent. Like we do the intro NLP this week and then the more advanced next week. Um, I think that may, might make more sense. And then we can do 47 and 48 the following week. Yeah, so I just want to have an order. This week is 43 and 44. Yep. Right? And next week is 45 and 46. It'll be 45, 46, and 49. And 49. So 45 okay. and 46 will be combined on Monday. And before the capsule, how many weeks do we have? Um, good question. Let me... It's a month, right? Yeah, you'll have at least a month, but let me just check the calendar to make sure. Um, a month for this module or because we went last like last module went really fast. I think it's I think it's like a month and a half for this module. I think capstones do like second week of June. Um, let's see. So we are August part time. So that is this column. Okay, so mod seven is supposed to go. Oh, we have mod seven? <laughs> no, mod seven is the capstone. Sorry, they just okay. called it. So, <laughs> no, mod six is supposed to end the 24th of April. So we will probably finish up maybe a week ahead of that, the week, the week of the 17th. Um, 
So then the capstone isn't due until June 19th. That's when you guys will graduate. Um, but actually, no, because you'll have to, you'll probably have to schedule the review and stuff before then. Um, but you'll basically have from the end of April until like at least the beginning of June for the capstone. Perfect. So like so four weeks. Yep, at least four weeks. Okay. All right. I'm Thank you. Stop recording. <laughs>